All right, welcome everybody. Um, if you've been to any of our previous webinars, you obviously well, you recognize the dynamic duo that is Adrian and Christina. If you have not, welcome. Uh, my name is Christina Caesar, and I manage marketing and communications at Synergy Technical. And I have the honor of moderating and introducing today's presenter, Adrian Amos. Um, today's webinar, and this is a mouthful, is Microsoft <laughs> Defender External Attack Service Management, or EASM, or ESM, as I've been calling it this morning. Um, but just a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and please drop any questions in the Q&A function within Teams. And just really briefly before, uh, I know Adrian, you have a lot of content you wanna cover, so I'll be brief, but yeah. just a little bit about us. Um, Synergy Technical is an IT consulting firm headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we have clients in all 50 states and over 70 countries, and we manage over 3 million licenses through our licensing and managed services practice. Consolidated it to one sentence. Ha. And yeah, with that. Um, Whoa, that that was it? No, you're right. Actually, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> wow. All right. No. <laughs> and, um, no. And now to introduce the amazing presenter, Adrian Amos. Oh, okay. So yeah, he. This is what he wanted. So Adrian is. No, one I just of, was impressed that you had gotten the whole about I got us it. down to a Honestly, sentence. Honestly, I have perfected this. I have perfected right. the sentence. Cool. I got it. That down pat. Your introduction. I need to practice more. <laughs> so obviously, um, so Adrian obviously is one of our uh, top solution architects with a specialization specialization, excuse me, in both productivity and security solutions. And he's had the honor of running both productivity and security immersion experiences at Microsoft Ignite, as well as led work sessions with clients all over the world. I think now you've yeah. done like Europe. I think how many continents do you have now? Oh, I don't count by continents. Oh, I think that's like the easiest. All right, two. It's the easy. Okay, well, a lot of Europe. Okay, yeah, I okay. should have done countries. I'll, <laughs> next time I'll do countries. Um, and recently, you can find him all over our social media page because we I know we've done so much video content like this one. Yes. And like either you've been by you did a um, you did like a promo video for this webinar on a bike, right? On I, your Windows I 365? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I was pretty excited about this one, so I had to get out and get a little bit of uh, yeah teaser content ready just because I, I this was this was new and interesting for me yeah uh, um but with that sorry now i remember his introduction i will now hand things over to adrian all right and thank yeah. you christina and and, and by the way for people who are watching this recorded later we are aware of some resolution challenges on existing yeah. content and so hopefully uh, this will be uh better if if nothing else the webcam should be uh yeah improved, we've so. got some a lot of bougie lighting in here now. There's a lot of. <laughs> All right. So Microsoft has obviously introduced uh, a couple of new products uh, in the last couple of months, and they are both in the Defender space, and we're really only tackling one today. So the question that we have to solve is, as we continue to expand this Defender portfolio, exactly what problem are we trying to solve, right? We've got a whole lot of Defenders sitting around defending a whole lot of things, uh, but sometimes it, it gets tricky to understand how things fit together. So uh, what I actually did on, on the bike video, and, and it actually helped me really frame the discussion around this, was we started to think about how Defender defensive and, and protective solutions impact us in the way that we would apply them to our home, right? So um, and there's a million Defender products, but they're all designed to look at our solutions and our infrastructure and our digital estate from how we perceive it. But there's a pretty big difference between how we perceive our digital estate and how an attacker perceives our digital estate. And there's fundamental differences too, and not just in how they perceive it, but also how they attack it. Uh, we tend to think in checklists, they tend to think in graphs and matrices. So for us, everything we check off the list is something that we've done. For them, everything they can't do is a branch point. It's a new decision path. It's something else to try. So really, if you think about it, it relates a lot to how we think about defending our houses versus you can actually hire a burglar to break into your house and tell you how to do it. This goes, you know, very back to the idea of the movie Sneakers, right? Most people are familiar with, with Robert Red yeah. Sneakers, right? They hired him to come in. You know, yeah. red teamers think of this as penetration testing, right? But but this is not quite that. So we're 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 bred, we're bridging the difference between in IT security terms, blue team and red team making a purple team here, looking at taking an attack perspective at our environment so we can understand 
are gaps in our security posture that are presented by both the things that we know and the things that we don't know, and also to find the low hanging fruit. So let's expand on that idea a little bit, right? So you have your nice new beautiful home, right? And it's got a garage on it. It's got some doors and windows on the first floor and the second floor, and there's some shrubs around the outside. And you as a homeowner know that before you go to bed at night, you need to do some basic things, right? You wanna close your curtains. You wanna make sure that there's no space for a burglar to hide behind some bushes to get in. You're gonna lock your doors and windows. You're gonna make sure you have some exterior lights. You're going to put a yard sign that says, you know, homesecuritycompany.com in the corner. Uh, and you're going to put a mail hold on your travel so it doesn't all stack up on the front porch. Now, then you move over and you call up one of those home security vendors and you say, hey, I, I feel like I've got some pretty good stuff going on here. What do you recommend? And they come in and they stand in your living room and they look at your house the way you look at your house, right? And they say, mm -hmm. That door lock isn't sufficient. You need a motion system over here. It would sure be great if you had a silent alarm system that would call us, call the police, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. You want to lock uh, secondary elements that maybe you hadn't thought about. You want to make sure that you have any pet doors locked up, right? They're going to still look at your house as how to defend your castle. Right. Mm -hmm. So we are still mostly in a castle defense, but we're layering on additional protections. We are adding on like a defender portfolio product, right? In the way that we would traditionally think about it. But now we're going to move into the attacker's mind space, right? Oh and this is actually the MITRE attack framework as it exists uh, as of April of this year. Uh, you can pull this the same graph off the the website that's listed down at the bottom there. Now I see why you made a disclaimer about the the. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Right, the low resolution yeah, images yeah, are, are like challenges. Yeah. So, but this is not. You don't need to. You don't need to hang on this. Right. This this is this is the MITRE attack framework that we use in information security to help understand our risks and our attack surfaces. And this is basically how an attacker looks at your house. Right. So. Uh, I was actually on ADT's website getting information for this, and uh, they say that 34% of uh, burglars just walk right up, twist your front door, and walk in. 23% open a window. Another 22% will walk up to a back door and walk in. So that's like 78-ish percent right there, or 70-something percent of attackers are literally just walking up, opening a surface, and walking in. So we need to think about what happens when they can't do that. Uh, they said 6% will use materials that are laying around on your property, right? And, uh, you know, I, I have had friends and family who have called me and said I'm locked out. Uh, you know, sometimes there's a key hiding somewhere on the property. Sometimes it's it's whatever. But, you know, I've had people say, I don't know how to get back into my own house. And you walk over, you open the shed, which is unlocked. You pull a ladder down, you set it up against the window and you open up a second floor window and you get in the house. Right. Mm -hmm. So everything that we see as a defensive uh, motion, the door is locked. Well, that's not going to stop the bad guy trying to get in. They're just going to change their tactic. They're going to move on. They're going to maybe try to figure out if there's an unsecured pet door, if there's something that that we haven't thought of and that your home security system hasn't thought of. But critically, while they're doing all that reconnaissance to try to figure out how to get in, they are also trying to trick to not trigger your alarms, right? And that's where they want to be successful is in not triggering triggering your alarms. So when we start thinking about layering in this, this idea of looking at our environments as an attacker would, we want to make sure that we are not triggering any alarms because at that point, we're just generating log traffic. We're not here to pen test. We're here to actually just see what our security posture looks like and get this external reconnaissance so that we have an idea of what the bad guys are going to try to explore, bef exploit before they get started. So all of this got started for Microsoft last year when they purchased uh, Risk IQ as a company. And there were a lot of questions uh, at the time. You know, what is it Microsoft is getting ready to do with this acquisition? You know, are they getting ready to turn around and and you know go after some of the the known big security partners, the the Mandiants and all that kind of stuff? Are they trying to like put together a security practice around this? Uh, but what they actually ended up doing about a year later, I guess it's actually uh, 13 months almost to the day, was turning that acquisition into two separate products, two new products in the Defender space. One is Threat mm -hmm. Intelligence. Uh, that actually is an additional layer of threat intelligence from what's reported in Threat and Vulnerability Management. And then the other one is this ESOM, I've been calling it. Easy, yeah, <laughs> Ex Defender External <laughs> Attack exact Service, Service Man Management, right? I've been practicing that all, it, all it, day. When I tell you, it's just like... Well, rolls right off the tongue. Oh, yeah, it, it's, 
smoothest. Yeah. And 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 for anybody who did watch the bike video, yes, I was improperly calling it Defender for external attack surface management <laughs> because every other Defender so far had been a Defender for something. This is simply Defender external attack surface management. So uh, again, the idea is we're using, and as it says right here, we're using inter internet facing resources, or, or I'm sorry, we're using Microsoft's internet scanners to detect internet facing resources, even agentless and unmanaged assets with continuous monitoring without the need for agents or credentials to provide and prioritize vulnerabilities, right? So um, this has actually become pretty important. And interestingly, the first real major use and test case of this was actually in uh, Microsoft donating $107 million worth of this stuff to defending Ukraine. Awesome. And yeah, so this special report that was announced that was published on June 26 predates the public release of Defender EASM. Because it didn't come out August of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the on the previous page right there, it says August 2, 2022. So so this was in advance of that, right? Obviously, the product didn't exist yet in a consumer format, but Microsoft was already using this at a pretty large scale to detect for the first time in warfare history where cyber attacks were aligning with conventional attacks. Uh, and what actually it allowed them to do, you might remember from the news, like hearing that, like, we suspect that this train yeah. station is going to be under attack. We yeah. suspect that this nuclear facility is going to be under attack, right? A lot of that information was actually this data was the recognition that there were cyber attacks going against these facilities that were then aligning with what what the Russian government had been doing of attacking cyber and then attacking conventionally a couple of days later. So so that's actually where a lot of that information came from. Yeah, it's absolutely wild. I, was gonna say, I even studied up on this before this webinar so that I wouldn't look so dumbfounded and like shocked, but I love like moments like yeah. that. Was, that was my, that's really, that's awesome. Yeah, and like I said, $107 million yeah, worth of- not of, like you know, cash. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Like, so- all of that is great, right? And 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 we'll get into what it looks like, but I want to cover the fact that yes, there are attack surface capabilities within the rest of the Defender suite, okay? And we have always looked at it as ASR, attack surface reduction tools in the Microsoft 365 Defender suite. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this actually, I, I, this this just popped up uh, in my in my news feeds yesterday. I was very excited. I think this went live last week. Uh, this is in the Microsoft 365 Defender Security Reports. You now actually have a report of your ASR rule detections, your uh, protections, your blocking, all that kind of fun stuff. You can now actually see from an insider's perspective, for the known digital estate that you own and the devices that you manage, what is the attack surface of those devices? And it goes through into what are your rules? What are your configurations? How are they actually being applied? Uh, then actually taking that and correlating it to security recommendations that you can then throw over the fence to the Intune team that will show you, you know, right now I can see that there are exposed threats for all of these things on the list. And there are currently exposed devices in my list. But just because there are exposed threats and exposed devices doesn't mean that they're externally surfaced. And that's the difference, right? I can make these configuration changes, but if this device sits behind a firewall and it doesn't talk to the internet, I may have other risk mitigations in place. But the second one of these devices sits out on the internet and it's got a critical vulnerability and it's hosting some sort of service or something along those lines, mm -hmm. now I potentially have a blind spot that my traditional defender mechanisms couldn't recognize. So. We take those rules, those recommendations, those detections, and we move over into the endpoint manager side. And you can see that we can actually define ASR rules in configuration profiles. We can also take those into our Defender for Endpoint Security Baseline. So that's the step up level security baselines that are made available through Defender for Endpoint. It's right there, Attacks, a rule, attack surface reduction rules are baked into it. And then we also have in the endpoint security section of Endpoint Manager, where we have the ability to directly create policies specifically for attack surface reduction. So there are a lot of existing capabilities within this to manage the rule sets and ensure that our devices and our endpoints and our whatevers yeah. all receive these rules and are configured similarly. But now we want to look at it from outside. And that is where this new perspective comes in. We are now stepping out of our environment and saying, OK, I've done my due diligence. What does it look like from the other side of the wall? And that's where we get into these dashboards. Now, 
Uh, I'm going to caveat this and say you're going to see a lot of masking in here, and um, we will cover explicitly why you're going to see a lot of masking of data in here, but this is a lot of raw content. And it isn't necessarily my raw content, and it isn't necessarily Microsoft's test raw content. It is somebody's raw, actual, real content. So we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, there you go. All right. I know. Oh, I'm excited. So Say, what we see here is a, just a general overview of what's known about this particular environment. And in this case, it's a huge environment, right? Uh, 3 million hosts, 8.5 thousand domains, 16.4 thousand web pages, 787 SSL certs, right? There's just a ton of stuff right here. But this overview is also going to prioritize my knowledge of a few critical areas, right? Uh, attack surface priorities that are organized in high, medium, and low, with which correlate to CVEs. Those CVEs then are then broken down farther down into the next um, part of the page. Uh, but it's even going to show me things like on the right hand side in the low severity. Are we running deprecated technology, right? Maybe that software isn't on support anymore. Maybe it's OK, but you know, no one's writing update code for it. Uh, are we looking at hosts with expired SSL certificates? And then what we'll get into in a little bit is why some of that stuff matters, even when it doesn't look like it's stuff that would super duper matter. So if I dig in and actually look at my attack surface summary, right? So if we look on the left hand side, right, we have our overview, we have our inventory, we have our, our, uh, our dashboards and we have our, our discovery. We're going to go through and talk about some of the dashboards and then I'm going to jump back out and we'll talk about the discovery last because that's where that information about why you're going to see a lot of masking is. Okay, I'm trying to like pick the biggest screen so that I can. Yeah, you're all right. All right. So. In our attack surface summary, let me go back actually. Uh, with this all is, it presents more information than I can show in a single slide. So I, I have some you know, overlaps here. Uh, information about where we are hosting our, uh, our internet facing data, right? If you have, you know, we, we talked a, a couple months ago uh, in our intra um, uh, webinar Probably, about yeah. permissions management, right? And the yeah. ability to take permissions management from from Amazon, from Google, from Microsoft, mm -hmm. and do all of that in a single motion. Well, this is actually giving us another view of what that permissions management looks like. And this is saying in this particular environment, this company has a ton of stuff in Amazon, a fair amount of stuff in Google, not much stuff in Azure. And that's okay, right? This isn't meant to be like a, you know, we're, we're not mm -hmm. talking about hosting. We're just talking about the fact that we need to secure these resources. They also, though, have a couple of exposed FTP servers and a whole bunch of exposed SSH, right? So maybe these are things, and this is stuff that Microsoft can simply see because this stuff is facing the internet. That's, yeah, that's so deep. then we dig into SSL certificate expiration and domain expiration, and this one is wild, right? If I wanted to take over this company, maybe, okay, I'm an attacker. I know that most of my work is actually all about credential theft, right? No matter what we can do with these tools, most of my work is going to be credential theft. It's my 34% of the people who walk up and open the front door and are in your home, right? Yeah. So if I want to fish your users, I'm going to first try to send them an email to convince them to go to a website. If that doesn't work, I might look and see if maybe you have any expired domains that your users might expect to see mail coming from. I could buy one of those. I could hijack it. I could send an email that appears to come from a domain that you think you should trust because it used to be part of your infrastructure, but you let that expire and now it's mine, right? So as a bad guy, I can do material damage literally with nothing more than what's on this screen right here. Well, I mean, I have to actually drill into it, but we can. We can drill into all this stuff and we will in a little bit too. So we have our expired SSL certificates, right? And we know that can cause problems with broken links and all kinds of fun stuff there too. But domain expiration like really gives you a great view of like not just what's expired, but also what's coming up soon. Uh, I literally worked at a 3000 seat facility where somebody forgot to renew the domain root certificate and um, we didn't have a network for a day. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is this is real stuff that really, really matters. And so if I dig yeah. in, I go back to talking about those FTP servers that were up there. Now, these are this is mask data. These are fake yeah. IP addresses, but it really does reveal your IP addresses, right? Uh, and if you have IP addresses sitting out oh, there that are, are simply like serving up FTP, well, then you might want to drill, drill down into that device itself, into that IP address and see information about it. Uh, you know, where is it physically hosted in the world? What ASNs and IP blocks is it associated with? There's a discovery chain that comes up. You can look up information about its IP reputation, the other services 
services that are running on this machine. So maybe it's uh, a website, you know, and actually I did find one that as I was doing this where there's an unsecure login, and I may have this later on, an unsecure login form on a website that also happens to have an SSL capability on the same website. So like it's an opportunity to say, why not align those? Why would you have an unsecure? Yeah, so I mean, this is real world stuff that that, that actually- We have access to this data. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I didn't actually ask that. I'm yeah. gonna ask that, sorry. So, <laughs> but it's just, and, sorry. That's all right. So, so moving on into into our inventory, uh, and again, this this is this is actually this environment's data. Uh, if I had shown you the inventory on the other page, it would have just been a giant mask um, because there's there's so much real actual data there. Uh, but it's going to show you all of the hosts, all of the web pages, all of the IP blocks, all of the addresses, domains, SSL certs, all of that stuff and how it relates to keeping track of your inventory. And you can see where it has this state not equals empty. There's actually like five different states and we'll, we'll cover what those are. Uh, if you were to add filters, I mean, there's like hundreds of different things that you can filter by and it will go in and show you information about, you know, what is the status of it? Is it approved? Is it a candidate? Is it a dependency on some other thing? And that actually has to do with the ability of Microsoft's um, detection engines to determine if this is truly something that is yours or if it's adjunct to something that is yours or if it needs more investigation to find out if it's something that is yours. So if I click on any one of these, you're going to get that same basic overview page that we saw with that FTP host a minute ago, right? Mm -hmm. Anything that I can go look at, I can also dig into and see where is it hosted, you know, who is information about it, uh, any CVEs that may be present on the machine. Again, if it's got multiple services being hosted up in it, uh, I'm going to be able to see all the services listed here too. And it's all based on discovery information from seeds. And we'll get to those seeds as we move on into it. But there's a lot of information that if you're used to doing this from the Defender for Endpoint perspective, this actually looks sort of similar, right? We would mm -hmm. have where we have overview yeah. and services and trackers, we would typically have like the timeline and, and you know, exposures and yeah. known vulnerabilities. So we're, we're looking at a very familiar-ish view, but we're looking at this completely from the opposite side of the fence, just what can Microsoft see? So moving back down into it, uh, come down in here and then we look at the security posture side things. Uh, this is where we're going to see the, the CVEs that are existing out here. So web pages with a critical scored CVE are going to be something that you really want to be aware of. Uh, if there's anybody watching who doesn't know what a CVE is, uh, those are critical vulnerabilities. I don't know what the E stands for. I'm terribly sorry, but these are like the patches that have not been patched in your environment. You need to patch this. And if Microsoft can see this from a public internet facing listener, you're screwed. Well, anybody can see it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Put too fine a point on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it even will break down information too about like how you administer your domains. How many unique registrars are you using? And that can actually lead to situations that are just documentation errors. And it's that kind of stuff. It's that correlation of information where, where there may have to be documentation that traverses desks where attackers are looking to see what is the gap? What's the human gap in your chain? we can exploit and say mm -hmm. oh you know what i'm calling from this registrar you tried to change your domain blah 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 right and and yeah that kind of fun stuff we then move down into hosting and networking information about how this content is 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 serviced up here right domains and how they're configured um you know things that are not uh, prohibiting all kinds of other silly fun stuff right we're, we're we're looking at what these domains and networks will allow users to do and then we get to my favorite one open ports um, yeah, so we looked at that FTP server, right? But that FTP yeah. server doesn't necessarily mean it's an unsecure environment or even necessarily that it's a particular risk. I mean, when we go down through and we talk about uh, secure score, we have the yeah. ability on any one of those things to say, mark this as risk accepted, right? There's a risk mm -hmm. acceptance plan built into this. But that's not always going to be the case. And sometimes we may have a remote access port that an administrator enabled for some particular purpose, forgot to disable, and now it's a real problem. And in this particular case, we have 67 remote access ports enabled. So let's take a look and figure out what in the world is happening here, right? Uh, in this case, now when I click on open ports, I'm actually looking at all of the known port types in here, and I'm going to get an explanation of what the risk is, why it matters, and how to remediate it. Uh, and you can see that on every single one of these, it's an IP address that is something that is known to be associated with my environment. Again, that whole approved status means that it is known to be mine. 
So if I dig into any one of these and I look through here, uh, I'm going to see that in this particular case, hey, look at that. All the five of these uh, CVEs that are associated with this one IP address that's serving up a system port or a remote access port, they're all open SSH for Windows 8.1. So now I have some really information, interesting information about this device. I know it's IP address. I know it's serving up a system port. I know it's running Windows 8.1 and I know it's unpatched. If you're still running Windows 8.1 even I please update your computer, please. Yes, please. right. <laughs> and, and again, so like we got all this information now that's correlating and coming together about this particular device and, and we're going to need to probably take some actions to remediate some of these things. Now, I did mention that we have this, what it is, why it matters, how to fix it. That is universal for everything in here. Um, and, and it's really important that we get this contextualized information about why these things matter. And I'm not going to drain the slide here and talk about all this stuff because, you know, honestly, what you want to do is get started, have it serve up what your information is, and then read up on why those things matter. Because frankly, they, they may be things that, that, that aren't obvious. Um, but critically, how to remediate. Uh, in the current incarnation of this tool set, and this will make total sense once I say it out loud. In the current incarnation, there is no automatic remediation. There's no mechanism that you can reach in and say, fix this, right? Uh, I, I do think that what we are seeing right now is, you know, Microsoft is, is really, really good at getting awesome new products out into the market. But what they tend to do is they go to market V1.0 as minimum viable product, which is totally fine, right? Um, but what I think will happen is we'll start to see integrations and touch points between the CVEs mm -hmm. and Defender for Endpoint and Microsoft Endpoint Manager. But right now, those integrations don't exist. Uh, so when we look at how to remediate, you're going to see they're going to use words that explain things that you need to do something as a person. You need to make a process change, right? We talk about that in our compliance manager, our purview mm -hmm. stuff, that technology is a common or that yeah. compliance is a combination of people, processes, and technologies. So we have the technologies in place, but we now you need to use processes to secure them. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to say thing, centralized governance, assign ownership, practice least privilege, right? Review how the life cycle of things is managed. So these are things that you have to do, right? It's not something that in these three particular cases, you can point a system at and have it do for you. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we also have a whole section in here about GDPR compliance. Uh, and that's actually a really interesting thing too, because again, compliance manager itself, as we yeah, said, has, began yeah. as an assessment of your GDPR footprint. Uh, and I think this is a really interesting thing because when we tend to think of attack surfaces, uh, we don't really often think of GDPR as an attack surface, and it really may not be, except that it's going to attack your wallet with the fierceness if somebody does take you down on a GDPR violation. So think of it as an attack on your security and your money. Yeah. So uh, so we want to know, right, what are we doing with exotic things like having broken uh, registrations, broken websites, you know, bad SSL, broke, broken certificates, all that kind of fun stuff. And then we want to dig down into it and we want to look at are we serving up PII, right? And yeah, we can get information about that through here too. And are we serving up PII from a site that has a broken uh, SSL certificate? That's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's a problem. And then we get to this one, login websites by protocol. You seem and, so excited. Well, I mean, like this is just, this is really cool, right? What no, we, just, we can actually look at. Insane how much data. Yeah, the security data. posture of authentications and like what is the SSL mechanism, what's, what's the authentication mechanism? ND5, SHA1, right? all these other ones, uh, or just plain old, it's HTTP. And that is where I started finding that server that has, a, you know, unsecurewebsite.poorchoices.com, right? So sure. Totally made up, yeah. right? We got fake information in here as well. But this is that website legitimately in this uh, real environment that is serving up an unsecure form. I mean, here, right here, it says insecure form right yeah. here that they're encouraging a, a human being to go interact with and submit PII data, right? And if I were to click over here on web components and CVEs and, and services, uh, this site has a valid SSL certificate. Maybe not for this intended purpose, but somebody was exactly. thinking when they built this website and then they weren't thinking when they added this form. So it helps us identify these gaps, right? You might, as a system administrator, look and say, well, that server's got SSL, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But are you serving up sites that 
are not using that. So it's really, really great way to get a better understanding of what's being presented to the internet from the other side. Now, the last section in, in our little list of, of dashboards is the OWASP top 10. Uh, and you'd be forgiven if you are new to this and you don't know who OWASP is. In fact, uh, here's our delightful little Bing result here. It's the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, they produce a list of top 10 critical security uh, lists and uh, here we are thinking in lists again right yeah. but that's okay so <laughs> we love we our acronyms to... and we love our lists and yeah our yeah acronyms. and of course you know all the attackers are laughing right now saying yeah well we don't do lists right so yeah. but in broken access control cryptographic failure injection insecure design security misconfiguration vulnerable and outdated components isn't even the number one right so we had all this stuff about ssl certificates it's, it's that's that's meat that's meat on the bone right there uh, identification and authentication failures, software and data integrity failures, security logging and monitoring, and server-side request forgery, right? So these are the current top 10 things. And if we correlate that to our, our current inventory, which I'm not gonna do because again, it shows too yeah. much. Um, it's yeah. gonna show you again, all these things, why they matter, how to, remediate, how to remediate them, and active instances of those being a problem in your environment. Now, how do you get started? How do you get to this? Well, this is what's interesting. And this is the only product other than Defender for Cloud that is an Azure resource. Uh, everything else is part of the Defender uh, suite or it's, yeah. you know, or it's, it lives yeah, over here, it lives over there, whatever. This is one of only two Defenders right now that lives inside Azure. In fact, even the uh, Defender Threat Intelligence doesn't live inside Azure. So, you know, Microsoft buys two components of the same you know, company oh. and one lives in its own separate portal. Yeah, and this one is Azure though. So okay. so to get started in this, this is actually really kind of interesting. Uh, all you need is a subscription and a resource group. You will notice in here as we go through and, and build out this environment, you're going to give it a name, you're going to give it a region, but you're not going to give it uh, any sort of Azure storage. You're not going to give it any sort of you know, fundamental underpinning services that it would rely on. No log analytics like Sentinel, right? In order to get started yeah. with Sentinel, you have to present some log analytics and some storage. This is not that. This is a fully self-enclosed, self-contained uh, system. And once you've created that resource, you're going to then go in and uh, you, you're going to give the group a name, right? And the name's, name is going to be the company you're looking at. You're going to then provide it seeds. And these seeds are intended to give Microsoft the tools necessary to start looking for information about your environment. Now, you're, I, in my case, gave it a couple of domain names, uh, but you can give it IP blocks, hosts, email contacts, ASNs, certificates, even who is information, or you can click on this import seeds from an organization button. And this is interesting information, and this, this has caused a little bit of a, of a ruffling of feathers. Um, when you do a search for your environment or when someone does a search for your environment they're putting that information into the microsoft security graph it's out there right and even if they don't that information is out there right microsoft mm -hmm. is not surfacing any information that isn't publicly visible and isn't publicly available okay you're correlating it you're adding it together and you're presenting it into your own environment that has been done for a lot of organizations. And so what you can actually do is you can come out here and look for seeds that are already known to exist for multiple organizations. And yes, I looked for Synergy um, and I added, if you were to go in here and click on any one of these, what it would do is actually add the seeds from that organization into these areas. Uh, so you can actually kind of get up and started pretty quickly if somebody has already searched for your organization or if Microsoft has collected information on your organization or anything like that, you may actually already be in here. If you're not, when you come in here, you give it a couple of seeds and you say go and it will spend up to like 48 hours scanning the internet for information about your environment. And what's really important to understand is that this scan is not intended to be intrusive. So again, just like when we talked about our, our burglar, right? He's walking around, he's looking for open doors. He's not trying to be intrusive until it's time to make the attack. This is not penetration testing. This is not red teaming, although it could be considered as reconnaissance for either one. So 
we're going to give it seeds. It's going to use those seeds to look for information out there. It's not going to go probing ports. It's not going to go bumping on front doors. It's not trying to trigger any acts or honey pots or anything like that. But then once we give it those seeds and kick off the discovery, we can set it to run either weekly or never run again. Microsoft is actually scanning information on the internet daily, but our actual scans of our seeds can be set to run on a weekly recurring basis. So we'll be able to see, uh, you know, asset discovery over time, right? If you're if you're looking at 50 assets for about three weeks, then all of a sudden you get 3,000 assets. Another yeah. week, you 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 may have stumbled across a problem. Um, but <laughs> yeah, but you can always come back in and edit your discovery and add more seeds to 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 your search. So if you mm. purchase another domain, if you make a corporate acquisition, whatever, you can go back and add those seeds back in and it'll augment your existing search. So that's what then produces this inventory after a couple of days. Uh, and then that's where we're going to get into understanding what these states are. So I did mention that approved means that it is known to be your owned attack surface. Uh, monitor only, right? It's relevant to you, but it's not directly controlled or critical dependency. What I tend to see a lot of though is candidates. Uh, and, and that's an interesting thing too. It's an asset that has some relationship to your known seeds, but doesn't have a strong enough connection to be labeled as approved. You can actually go into any one of these candidates and change it to be approved. So you can tell Microsoft, keep an eye on this for me. I, I want to look at this. Uh, and then, you know, there are ways, like I said, it, it states right in here that you can actually come in and go through these. Uh, candidate assets are only scanned during discovery process, right? So if you want them to be monitored on an ongoing basis, you must change them to approve. So this status has a little bit to do with how frequently you are monitoring these things, but it also has a knock on effect on licensing. So pricing and licensing, I never actually cover any of this stuff say, in any I'm webinar ever. I'm floored that yes. this, I'm looking at numbers with dollars you, like this. You are, yeah. This is a moment. I hesitated on adding this information because when I first started putting this content together, it was not publicly available. Uh, um, yeah, and and yeah, you've been playing with this since I yeah, yeah I have uh, and and Please. what I really wanted to call out about this is that so our licensing structure states IPs domains and hosts, but there are other types of devices that we can monitor, but this is for things that you have marked as approved. OK, so if you are monitoring a million hosts, you're going to be paying the 0.011 dollars per day to monitor those million hosts, right? Typical environment, maybe fairly small, not a huge cost um, to, to run this guy, but it is not costed out the same way as the other Defender tool sets. So, you know, we look at the, probably the closest is the other one that lives in Azure and that's Defender for Cloud, where we're looking at actually protections per protect or, or um, Defender per protected resource. Uh, but the cost structure is very different in that, even from what it is here. Is there a minimum resource count? There is not. In fact, you can run these numbers all the way down to 111. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that because it is an Azure resource, global availability is dependent on support in different Azure data centers. Now, this also speaks to data residency as well. Uh, so what I wanted to do was as this, you know, version one came online, you can see that it is available in most of the major geographic regions. I think I found exactly one major geography on the list that it simply wasn't available, and that is Qatar, uh, but it is available in the UAE, right? So in all of our major continental geographies, we do have support uh, day one for Defender EASM. Uh, you will note that it is not available for any of the US government data centers, um, but that doesn't really necessarily mean that you can't monitor uh, from the internet facing oh, yeah. resources, right? I mean, it's just, is it out there? Yeah. It's not really, you know, how do you protect it? The data is already unprotected. So it is available in all of our major geographies. The pricing is out there. The pricing is per monitored resource. Uh, but that's going to bring me to Q and A, and we're actually done a little bit earlier than I expected. I was going to say because you were you were stressing because you you were like I have so much content. He he yeah. literally was like Christina, can you speed through the introduction because I have a lot of content to go over. And look at it, it's twelve thirty nine. I mean, I had to fuss at everyone too fast. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, we got some good ones. Um, so how does 
I would keep wanting to say ESIM because I've been saying it all day. How does EASM get integrated with SAS? Uh, so ED like Dynamics or Power BI? That's actually a really good question. And I honestly, I don't know yet that the integration points are there, but if they are there, they would probably actually come from the Power BI side. Um, and I simply have not done that analysis yet. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it is an Azure resource. So if you can do, if you can throw automations at an Azure resource, there's probably integration points. Um, but yeah, I honestly, I haven't dug into those integrations. Um. So I guess also maybe like piggybacking off that question, does uh, EASM features do they do they overlap with dynamic application security testing in any way? Never mind, that doesn't overlap. The, I saw dynamic and I paralleled. Does EASM overlap with dynamic application security testing in any way? So what I have seen is that we're not looking at the actual apps themselves. We're looking at the security configuration of getting to the apps themselves. Is is probably the best way to look at it, right? We're looking at the SSL certificates. We're looking at whether or not, uh, you know, the, the hosts themselves are associated with IP risk or, or CVEs and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, I think once we actually get down into the application itself, then then we, we may be moving into different tool sets. Um, but frankly, I don't have any environments other than that one unsecure form that I was able to pull up where I could dig that deep into it and see but because this tool set by design does not trigger alerts, I can't imagine that it would be usable for testing application security once you're past the authentication level. Because you'd have to then yeah. present an authentication, yeah. which then would present yeah. an alert. Okay. Yeah. Um, so does EASM use log analytics or Azure storage? It does not. So I did cover that and that's it's, it's a great question. It's a great reminder. This is a full self-service tool set or, or self bundled and, and, and you know, standalone tool set. Uh, yeah, and like I said, with both with, with Sentinel, right, in order to have logs, you have to stick them somewhere and that somewhere is log analytics. Uh, this guy is just consuming uh, graph data and looking at information that's being presented from the Internet as a, as the Internet as a whole, as interpreted through these Internet facing detectors and the security graph. OK. Hmm. So is there any integration with Sentinel or M365 Defender? There is not yet. I do anticipate that there will be specifically with uh, with with taking the CVE data and correlating it back to uh, threat and vulnerability management and Defender for Endpoint. Um, the integration with Sentinel seems like it would be obvious, but I actually don't think it is because Sentinel is, while it is a, a, a security orchestration and automation, it's mm -hmm. still doing things based on logging. And we are not with this tool at a point where we're looking at logging. We're looking at configurations. We're looking at exposure. Um, so I think that, that there may ultimately be some integrations, mm -hmm. uh, but but it, it's looking at it from a before you have to log something. Yeah. Good for you. Um, let's see. Are there any actions that you can take on assets discovered in EASM, or is it just designed to provide visibility that you need to take action on manually? Again, that's where I think we're going to see progress come over time as we move from this version 1.0 into other uh, various, uh, you know, integrations. Uh, right now, as I said, that you know, there's for every single um, for every single thing that it detects, it's going to be what it is, why it matters, and how to remediate. Mm -hmm. And so far, all of the how to remediate are you need to go do something. Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, ooh, pricing, see, pricing calculator, and we never, you never yeah, do these. I never do it. And you, but you, okay, you did. You said yourself both of them. Um, so the pricing calculator only shows prices for IPs, domains, and hosts, but we also saw other items. Do other assets have? Oh wait, yeah. So we've well, so, well, there are other asset types, yeah, and they kind of, are covered in the approved list. But so far, they do not show up on the pricing calculator. So that's that's sort of that's uh, actually part of why I showed it uh, was was specifically because there are other known asset types that do not appear on the list. So um, yeah, right now my understanding is that the pricing is based solely on those three major asset types. 
IP addresses, domains, and hosts. So get this early so that you can check all of your devices before that they go in. <laughs> <laughs> and say yes, ways, ways, like yeah. what, what I'm coming to understand. Okay. Um, so does AASM only apply to your own online infrastructure? Yes, it has to be visible to the internet for Microsoft to detect it. And again, that's why we're hiring the burglar to break into our house, right? Or yeah. to tell us what are the weaknesses Fair. of our house, right? You know, it, if if you have uh, a safe room in your house that you would retreat to, that's probably not visible to the burglar. That's a great idea, right? If you yeah. if you think you're under imminent threat of home invasion, build a safe room. But like the second the burglar knows about it, it's going to lose a little bit of its value because they're going to try to then mitigate their, you know, their losses from you having that. So yes, in order for Microsoft to detect a vulnerability, these devices, these host IP addresses, domains, SSL certificates, whatever, they must be internet facing. If it is not internet facing, you're going to most likely know about it already through an inventory control and through other control systems that, that you have in place. So what kind of global data does Microsoft EASM pull from when analyzing your environment for threats and how often is it updated? So it's weekly update. Uh, well, you, you run your discoveries daily. weekly, but it is daily. daily. Yes, there's there's daily querying, but there's weekly discovery. Uh, and and again, it's all based on the seeds that you present, which it can again can include domains, uh, actual hosts, ASNs, IP blocks, um, SSL search chains, even public who is information is all out there uh, that that Microsoft will once. And uh, when I did it on my environment, I literally only gave it two domain names. And so it went back customer, and it's is the minimum that a customer can see their um, their like queries once a week. No matter like so like it doesn't matter how many threads like you could like to your point earlier, you can go from like 50 to 3000. In a week, but yeah, that's going to be a discovery. Next week, you can, yeah, right. so they, but you can only run a discovery once a week. You can actually set the discovery to never recur. You can do a one-time discovery, or you can do it to have it happen weekly. But you can't do daily. Is what I'm saying. No, you can't do a daily discovery. Only Microsoft. Okay, that that was sorry. Yeah, they I do. Probably worded they do way. daily was, assessment. Sorry, you do weekly discovery. Got it. Okay, yeah. that was what I was getting yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. People. Um. So, can you add any public domain as the domain seed, and are there any checks to see whether I own the domain? Yes, you can, and no, there aren't. Yes, because again, yeah, this like, is information that's simply out there on the internet, right? Uh, and and this that was the source of the controversy is, well, I, I don't want to put my data out there because then it's out there. Well, it is out there, and this is really just giving you the visibility to see what's known and available about your environment already. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, the change in behavior had been that when you first got started with this, you didn't actually go through the process of starting with a seed discovery. You went through how, what are the organizations that are already known, and if you don't yeah. find yours on the list, then you build a manual seed. So they flipped that around now and said, what are your seeds? Oh, and if you want to import seeds from a known discovery, you can also add that. Okay. Um, and then I think we kind of, you touched on this earlier, but should we be worried about our IP addresses being saved by Microsoft and being used for anything else. And they're not being saved. They're simply out there. They are out there. Your IP addresses are how you communicate with the world. It's DNS so that does the I magic. I was going to say, so this is where we get to the part that we can just look up everyone else's companies. Yeah. Just yeah, you can. Yeah, you want to know I how your competitors are doing? That's fine. But the problem is you're going to be paying for it, right? Yeah. So, you know, it, how much do you want to pay to know about your competitors on an ongoing basis? Mm -hmm. um, when I got started with this, it's a, it was a 30 day free trial. Um, so yeah, you can get out there and get started. Is, and package there up this information, like a, but is, is there still a demo environment or like a trial licensing option? That there is 30 day free trial right now, but I don't know what the scope is, how long that will last. Good. To, so mm -hmm. get on this people. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you know, when, when we first started doing um, Defender for Cloud Apps um, a few years ago, the, the the onboarding mechanism would be truly turn it on, walk away for two weeks and come back and go through the list of all of the, the mm -hmm. things that it found. I mean, that was how Microsoft was enabling it. Yeah. Just turn it on and come back in two weeks. This is kind of the same, right? This is, yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm confident of my digital estate. Well, yeah, okay, but, 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 but this is what we found with yeah. no real effort, right? Yeah. Um, so who in your organization or never, I'm not even gonna say outside because everyone can see all of your stuff 
we just clarified. But who in your organization can see the discovery reports or who needs like? So in order to create the instance, you have to be an Azure contributor. However, in order to read the instance, you really just need to have the the, the reader roles to um, to that environment. OK, yeah. But um, again, it's public information. It's yeah. just that's, well, that's why I took out the originally it said yeah. or outside. And I was yeah. like, we just everyone, 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 outside. everyone and yeah. their moms, everyone can see it. Um, so, and this is my last question now, and then if anyone has any last minute questions before I um, close, but please drop them in the chat. But can this tool be used for pen testing? So I, I did make a reference to that early on. Um, I think that this can be a precursor to pen testing because again, you're not, you're trying not to trigger alarms with this. You're mm -hmm. trying to understand what is out there exposed as a part of your digital estate. This can help you especially if you're getting ready to go through a round of audits or pen tests or whatever it is that you need to do for your cyber insurance requirements. Mm -hmm. This can help you understand what is my risk? How do I get ahead of starting to take actions to mitigate those risks before the auditor comes in and fails me? Yeah, that's what's so mind boggling to me is like you're saying like from the, the whole looking at it from an attacker's perspective, it's just like, but what, but without triggering it, yeah. it's like, it's oh, like yeah. you're, you're breaking in. Your just case in the joint. Yeah, you're just, yeah, it's yeah. technology, y'all. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so, oh, wait. And that one. So, does pricing for each asset type turn on the second it's discovered, or does it go back to the various states of an asset to determine whether or not you'll be billed for it? Ooh, okay. Um, that's a my good one. Understanding, said that? Good, my that's understanding good. is that you will be billed for assets that are under the approved state. Now, um, I, I don't want to, I don't want an EASM, Microsoft's own EASM, but I, I wouldn't, I don't know for sure if you move objects from approved back to candidate, if if you would then no longer be billed for them. Um, wow. We yeah, yeah, no, sneaky. yeah. We just yeah. there. Okay. Um, we just... Hey, you know what? It's publicly available information, right? So, you know. Is that just going to be the sort of like default? It's publicly available. Yeah, it's publicly We're available. To say it. We're That's allowed right. to say it. Um, yeah, there needs to be a disclaimer on our Q&A. Uh, yeah, now, I, my understanding right now is that, you know, once your 30 day trial expires, you will be billed for everything that is listed as an approved asset. OK, that is that is again version 1.0. That's my understanding yeah, of how the licensing is is uh, managed. As wow. you discover new onboarded new items to onboard, then they would come under. They would raise your licensing costs, right? Because you're on your by monitoring more devices in this particular environment that I was looking at where they had three million known hosts, it's going to get expensive in a hurry. Yes, very, very good. Um, so that was the last question that I had in the Q&A. Again, if anyone has any more, please drop them in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, as always, I love as you probably know like I'm still getting used to being like on camera with Adrian but I love like this talk show webinar thing we have going um but so the recording of this webinar will be available um by tomorrow I will email it to you and it will also be on social media and our YouTube channel please um like subscribe to our YouTube channel Adrian has done so much work on it recently I mean all of our content was there but it just he's he's so excited about it. like we're I don't even know how to describe how much like work you've done on our YouTube channel recently, but um, all of the recordings to all of our webinars literally over the last like year however many half. years are on. I think it's only about a year it? and a half. Yeah. yeah. Oh, never mind. Yeah, that's, cool. that's right. Yeah, we're we're, we're, like, we're going to go to the archives to get the old stuff. Like we're going to show you the Azure we'll interfaces from 2014. Anyway because the technology is probably not even accurate. The, it's not accurate anymore anyway. Um, but yes, and I'm not seeing any more um, questions, so I will give it out to you. And please keep up with us. So yeah, again, YouTube channel, uh, social media, and we have a webinar on the 22nd. So Jeffrey Lau, if you've seen any of his uh, Power Platform series, he is doing one on AI Builder. And um, I will include the registration link for that in the um, email that I send you as a follow up as well. And yeah, you, thank you. Um, if I do have anything else. No, that's it. Yeah, thanks everybody. It. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.